Have you ever wondered why some people seem to live up to the fullness of their ability, their capability? Uh, have you ever asked how someone is able to exceed their own expectations and those around them, even when faced with seemingly insurmountable odds? Uh, I would suggest that there's one question in addition to that that maybe gives birth to these, and I believe it's a question that everyone that's ever walked the face of the earth has asked, and that question is, why am I here? Uh, whether they've asked that question verbally, audibly, or they've kind of considered it and contemplated it, it's the question that gives birth to this whole idea of purpose and reaching uh, the reason that I'm here. I probably don't need to say too much about this. <laughs> but just this image uh, kind of evokes in you uh, some understandings based on your interaction with this. You know that it is filled with an energy source. Uh, you know that uh, given certain interactions, there can be a release of that energy source. You know that in and of itself, it is probably harmless until it is connected with the source. Right? Now, don't get nervous. <laughs> but just that imagery evoked in you this idea of what could happen, what is possible based on what's latent, based on what is innate in this object right here. Uh, so as educators, as mentors, as parents, we have the opportunity to look at individuals, and, and to some extent, we look at them the same way. We see something latent within them. We see something uh, resident within them. We see this this possibility not yet realized, and we ask ourselves, how do we get that out of them, and how is it expressed? Now, where this analogy kind of breaks down, quite honestly, is that we're not really looking for the one big explosion. We're not looking for the big bang and then the show is over. What we're really looking for is a continuous explosion, continuous number of explosions that gives way to a continuous release of energy. The idea that we're talking about is obvious. The idea is potential uh, that lies resident in all of us. Uh, I've heard it said once before that the greatest repository of potential is the graveyard. And it's a tragic statement because the implication is, is although we have this innate ability, we don't spend it and we take it with us unused. So the key is, how do we address this idea of potential, potential being uh, the ability that's not yet expressed? Potential is really the possible, but not yet. Potential is the energy that is stored within us that is waiting for some interaction in order to be released. But the question is, how do we release it? The question is, how do we start this cycle of continuous explosions resulting in a continuous release and expression of potential. And so I want to submit to you that the answer to that question lies in what I call the flywheel effect. Uh, the flywheel effect. The flywheel is simply a circular disc that rotates at a speed and it collects and stores energy and it supplies it when it's needed. If you're a car enthusiast, you know that cars have flywheels. If you're not a car enthusiast, perhaps you're familiar with uh, the little toy cars that we all had when we were kids, and you wind them up, and you wind, and you wind, and you wind. You're winding a little flywheel that's storing up energy to be released or supplied when it's needed. So the idea with the flywheel effect is how do we start this combustible cycle within those that we have interaction with that will result in a storing up and a release of something that's resident within us. I didn't have to tell you what this was, but the fact that you knew it without me saying anything about it says that you've had some experience with this. The key to the flywheel really begins at the base of the flywheel. It really begins with the notion of what gets it started? And I, I need to tell you that there's probably just three things you need to know about the flywheel. You don't have to be a mechanical engineer. 
The three things you need to know is that the flywheel, once it starts moving, it is really, really difficult to stop. The second thing you need to know is that the flywheel rotates with immaculate and impeccable balance in a, in a cycle that is just perfect and pure. And the third thing you need to know is that it's very hard to get the flywheel started. So the question then is, how do we start this cycle of continuous combustible activity that results in the release of what's inside of us? Without me giving you any explanation of what I held up, uh, you had some experience with it because you've interacted with it. If you know somebody that has interacted with it, uh, you've seen someone interact with it. So even though I didn't say a name, the picture of it came in your mind. Why? Because of your experience. Uh, experience is really the process by which we see and we know. It's the way that we make sense of information around us. It's the, it's the way that we, we, we process. It's the way that we process our input. So once again, without me saying anything and without me doing uh, much else, it's going to work here sooner or later. You get the picture of what I'm trying to do. You get an idea of what I'm trying to say because why? Because you experience. So experience lies at the base of the flywheel effect and it simply says that you really can't do what you can't see. But those things that you have seen, you can repeat. Remember, we're talking about not just the Big Bang, we're talking about moving this flywheel and it's hardest to get it started uh, from the beginning and the way you get it started is with experience. What you know, what you see, what you have experienced will determine what you ultimately see as possible in your life. The idea of possibility as we move up the flywheel, moving from experience to possibility. Possibility is really uh, this idea of a chance that something may exist, something may happen, or something may be true. Your experience tells you what might happen, what to expect, what might be true based on what you've seen or what you have done in your past. And possibility, once we understand that something is, is possible, then we're more prone to do something with that possibility. See, the fact is, uh, every day we make what I call possibility calculations. We make dozens, if not hundreds of possibility calculations every day, and they're based on our experience. You came into this room today and you sat down on a chair and you assumed certain things about that chair, that it would support you, that it would be safe, that you can sit, and you gave not a thought to it, why? Because you had experience with sitting down before which informed your possibility and allowed you to act. You will go into a room, perhaps later on today, and you will hit a light switch and you will assume and expect that light would come from that light switch, why? Because your experience with it has informed your possibility of what might happen, what might be possible, what might be true, and you had not to think about it. So the possibility calculations that we make, most of which are based on our experience and most of which are made in our subconscious. I also want to suggest to you that in our relationships with each other, that there are people that are in our uh, sphere of influence uh, as educators, as parents, as mentors, that have certain expectations because of their own experience. And so we have an opportunity to interact with them to explode this idea of possibility. Now the reason possibility is important, remember I said from the beginning that the most difficult part about the flywheel is getting it started. We're talking about the release of potential. We're talking about seeing someone act on the potential and realizing the ability and it starts with their experience that informs what is possible in their life. Once we see something as being possible, then we're able to act on what we see. We're able to act on what we see. It's interesting now we've moved from the base of the flywheel to the apex of the flywheel. We've expended a lot of energy getting from our experiences up to our possibility and you're already starting to make connections uh, with the importance and the influence of your experience. You're already starting to make connections uh, in your own lives about what you see as possible and how that could lead to action, or if you're not seeing it as possible, how it could lead to inaction. And we've all had conversations, we've all been in relationships, we've all had opportunities 
where we've experienced someone perhaps not living up to, not getting done, not carrying out the expectation or expectation that we have, and the focus tends to be here. We cajole, we bribe, we threaten, we do everything we can to change this when the solution is not here because this is simply a symptom. The solution is down here with their experience. It could be that what we are asking, what we are expecting has not been seen, so therefore the possibility is not there that it might happen, that it exists, that it's true, and so therefore it results in inaction. But let's assume that there's an experiential base that gave way to possibility that results in action. This is the tipping point of the flywheel. We've expended a lot of energy getting up and now we start to move on the down. The, the, the action is the idea that it proves the possibility. The action is proof of the possibility. So certainly if action is a proof of possibility, then there's a reinforcement of what we experience and thought is possible when we act. It is the most perhaps critical interaction of the flywheel is this notion uh, of action. You can also make connections with respect to the possibility calculations that we talked about. Your ability to act is reinforced and is relegated to your subconscious based on what you see as possible because of your experiences. And once we act on what we believe is possible, then we get results from our action. We get results or feedback that reinforces the action that we took that was predicated on the possibility that we saw that was given birth to by the experiences that we have. And once we get the result, it feeds back into your experience. Isn't that amazing? We make these possibility calculations based on experiences every day, and this cycle takes place every day. And your ability to perform is, is it can be characterized as an expertise because by definition, expertise comes when you have to think about what you're doing. And so we wonder, what does it take to release potential in our lives and the lives around them? It begins with their experience, understanding their experiences, giving way to possibility, action, results that informs their experiences, that produces more possibility, resulting in greater action, providing more results. And before you know it, the flywheel rotates with impeccable balance. And once it starts, it is increasingly hard to stop. Now, the question might be, what happens when there isn't a base of experience? What happens in our lives and in the lives of those that we are with uh, when there is not sufficient experience to do what we're expecting to do? Uh, what happens when we lack, when we don't have when I was growing up, whenever we lacked something or didn't have something, my mother would send me next door to borrow it. She'd send me next door to borrow a cup of sugar or a cup of flour. I would go borrow what I didn't have. And so the key to filling an experience gap for educators, for mentors, for parents, is we have to allow, lend experience to others, resulting in the borrowing of experience until they can make it their own. So once you borrow experience, it opens up possibilities leading to action, resulting in some kind of feedback output, which comes back into their own experience in which they make their own. I can't help but think about this example and be reminded of Helen Keller. Most of us know the story of Helen Keller, born blind, born deaf, born unable to speak. Uh, you could argue that her experiential reservoir was fairly shallow, if not empty. And yet with the interaction of Ann Sullivan, with the interaction with Ann Sullivan, who herself was blind, borrowed the experience from Ann Sullivan enough to where a whole world of possibilities opened up for her, which led to action, which led to result which she fed back into her own experience and became one of the legendary figures in our culture, but yet she lacked experience. 
I think the point I want to make in that example is, even though Helen Keller was born blind and deaf and unable to speak, doesn't mean she lacked potential. But because she lacked some of the ability that some others had, doesn't mean she was born without potential. And the same is true for those that we come in contact with. They may physically, from what we can see above the surface, have lack in their lives. But the fact of the matter is, doesn't mean that they lack potential. The hard work about mentoring and educating is not the delivery of material, it's the understanding of how we build an experiential base to make relevant and possible new opportunities that inspire action. So how can we be more involved? How can we be more effective in the lives of others? And even in our own lives, because some of us are applying this principle to our own lives. How do we become catalysts? It's by first remembering that I do not have everything that I need, nor do you have everything that you need which renders us interdependent because I need you, and guess what? You're stuck with me. That right there can begin the interaction, the exchange, the flow begins the flywheel turning. So the thing that's incumbent upon you and I is to light it up. Thank you.